All right, guys, I have referenced this video a ton over the past couple of weeks, pretty much a month, a month and a half since Long Point. Uh, it's finally here. You can go check out Mike Edelson's talk on HEMA as an actual martial art and how we should actually train it as a martial art and not just train for tournaments, etc. Um, and thinking of it a little bit differently, changing our mindset. Um, it is available, link in the description below. I will go ahead and warn you, this, this uh, talk gets to a moment where it is um, not safe for work because of violence, um, not safe for life because of murder and gore. Um, part of that is to illustrate a point, so it's not necessarily for the faint of heart. Luckily, that, that actually gets called out. You can skip over those parts. Um, but it's a very long talk and it's a very, very good talk. And I think it's something that has, I, I've been kind of dwelling on in my mindset as an instructor for HEMA on exactly how I want to incorporate it. Uh, I'm still kind of figuring that out. I've been talking to people at my club about it, but I think it's exactly what needs to happen is these conversations need to happen about, well, what do we do with this information? We know that we're doing a martial art and it's a martial art with big swords that are meant to kill people and we don't train that way. So what do we do? And I want to give a little bit of thoughts now that that video is available. Uh, so my recommendation would be if you haven't seen the talk, pause my video right around here uh, and come back to it once you've watched it. Uh, because I'm just going to talk a little bit as, as much as I can remember of the talk. It's been a while since I've, I've actually watched it. Um, but I'm going to give you my thoughts on what I think about it. So pause video, go watch it, come back here. And now if you've come back here after having watched the talk from Mike Edelson. Um, let me tell you what my thoughts are on it. I think he's absolutely right. I think that we actually train in historical European martial arts a little bit wrong. Uh, whether you're doing it with Fiore or uh, some Lichtenauer tradition or you're really focused on Meyer or you do Pan-European or whatever it is, we often focus on just the longsword. A lot of us just focus on just the longsword and we get really good at it and we go to tournaments. We, we, we learn how to fight for tournaments and we, we have rules in tournaments that are meant to keep us safe, but then they don't necessarily promote the right martial practice. We don't really understand how a sword actually fits into the larger scheme of things. We think of us entering the fight with a sword instead of entering the fight with a sword on our hip and a dagger on our hip and a polearm in our hands. Um... And to have that mindset shift is actually really important. You have to have that because if you don't, uh, then what you're really doing is no better than what a McDojo does, right? Someone who just trains you to, you know, throw light punches and do forms and say hi -ah at the right moment. Um, and you walk away with actually not being able to actually win a fight. You know, you go up against some person who's been training MMA and they're going to own you. Um, so we need to understand exactly what we're training and why we're training it. And I think this is actually going to end up resulting in long term. There's going to be a split. There's going to be a shift. Uh, and there's going to be a polarizing effect within the HEMA community. This will be pretty much the second time that Western European martial arts have experienced something similar to this. Um, but this, this second time will be much more of a peaceable one, I think. And you're going to end up having a split that doesn't necessarily split school from school, but within a school, mindset changes that have to be accounted for. And that is, we're going to focus on fighting for tournaments, and we're going to be focusing on fighting for uh, an actual lethal duel. And uh, the lethal duel part is much more academic in a lot of ways because we're not going to go out there and try to kill each other. Uh, someone might, but they're really crazy and stupid. Um, and the tournament side is going to be to get that more active part and that communal participation. It's going to be really tough to do that because we train a certain way and we, we learn things really poorly. Um, in actually working with one of the faders that I'm going to be doing a review of, I was using the fader and I was using it with some spes heavies. And I noticed very quickly there are certain things I could not do with the grip on that sword being what it was and the spes heavies being what they were and how they're designed. And I'd have to modify for that. And that would be okay in a tournament, but in a, in a martial arts standpoint, it would be a very bad idea. Likewise, when you look at something as simple as how to do a proper zwerkow, for example, um, which I always define as striking with the other edge of the sword. It's the easiest definition I can give for it in, in a flat manner, and that's a very loose term. Um, but you see a lot, a lot of new people who learn how to fight, they, they hit with like a long edge, and they turn around, they hit with a long edge again, and they do this certain motion that they think is right based on what they've been seeing, but it isn't correct for his workout. 
And likewise, going into something like a shale howl where you hit uh, kind of into a flug-ish, extended flug motion with the short edge of the sword uh, that's designed to some extent to help set you up for other things. And a lot of times when we talk about tournaments, all that stuff goes out the window because you just try to get your hit in and you don't consider what actually is most efficient. And we teach ourselves bad habits because our hands can't turn certain ways, etc. And Mike specifically addresses this, right? He says, you know, the, we, we train with these gloves, we train with these gear, and, and they, they don't have the mobility that even sometimes a knight in armor would have. Um, and you, you, you miss out on a lot of what you should be doing. And you teach yourself bad habits manners or bad habits there we go habits is the right word teach yourself bad habits and those habits then affect everything else right just like you got to have great footwork and you have to maintain great footwork you can't have bad handwork in holding a sword and then expect it to work real well in an actual setting not that we're going into an actual setting we have to be cognizant of that but it all comes down to why do we train this and I think that you're that we're seeing a little bit you we we're, we're seeing a bit of boredom come within people who are uh, veterans of HEMA. Uh, so whether they be Mike Edelson or uh, Michael Chittister or Jake Norwood, um, they've been doing this a long time, and I, I can't say I've been doing it quite as long as them, but I've been doing it for a while. And the tournament scene becomes something that's still interesting, but doesn't quite hold the same level of. Um, value anymore in a lot of ways and, and there's a shift towards trying to understand the martial arts side better because it's a harder problem to solve uh, especially from a safety standpoint in terms of training it so um, I think that aspect is really interesting in terms of training the other thing I think is really interesting is the focus uh, to some extent and it was really only briefly covered in the talk on understanding anatomy and how that plays into it I would actually define this more as understanding not only anatomy, but understanding the dichotomy of the human body. <clears throat> and the dichotomy that I'm talking about is the, the odd juxtaposition of the human body being incredibly fragile, and it doesn't take much to be lethal, and at the same time, how the human body is incredibly resilient and how resistant it can be to something like death. And it seems like such a simple thing can kill someone, and sometimes the most horrific thing, they can survive. So whether you're Rasputin getting poisoned, shot, stabbed, rolled up in the carpet, and thrown in a, in a river, and still somehow surviving all of this type of thing, um, likewise, there can be someone who can just trip and fall and hit their head, and... They, they get up and they're like, oh man, that hurt, and they have a headache for a couple hours, and then they pass away. Um, and understanding that the human body is incredibly vulnerable, but is also very resilient, is important to understanding the martial arts side. This is graphically illustrated in the talk that Mike Ellison gives, because he, he speaks to machete fights. The closest thing we have to the modern day sword fight, better than knife fights in terms of trying to understand the mechanics of it, <clears throat> But people don't just die when they get a, a cut, right? If you get cut on the forearm, you're not dead. Likewise, if you get cut on the forearm, it, do, it doesn't even mean that you stop using the sword that you're holding on to. And you're really only going to be kind of angering the rhinoceros, as it were, right? You, you will just amp up the person. The adrenaline is going to pump more. They're going to get more enraged, crazier, and they're going to come after you that much harder. And if you give them a mortal wound, then they have nothing to lose, and they charge in even harder. Um, because just because it's a mortal wound doesn't mean they drop dead. And we get very used to this concept in the modern age because guns kind of do that to people. Uh, generally speaking, guns are very good at dropping individuals. And this is a very violent concept, so please bear with me if you're kind of faint of heart. Um, but that's what we're talking about here, guys. We're talking about a martial artist designed to do grievous injury, if not kill people. And uh, we get so used to that aspect of the violence, the modern violence, that we, we kind of fail to understand what it looks like when someone goes up against a knife or a sword or a machete or something. So trying to understand that is really important for understanding what makes a good strike, right? If I do a, uh, a strike, just a real basic strike at someone's head, and I'm just a little bit flat, just a little bit flat with that blade hitting right here on the head, uh, the skull's just going to redirect that. You might cut off the ear, right? Uh, that's about as good as you're going to get. Um, <clears throat> likewise, if you hit 
dead on, you might actually break or go into the skull if you've made a really solid strike. But that difference is really minor and really important. Suddenly, edge alignment truly matters. Likewise, you're not going to go right deep into a body, into the kind of more fleshy part of the body, if you don't strike with a really good edge alignment. So edge alignment becomes increasingly important. Likewise, in the thrust, if you thrust someone, let's say, here in the throat, right, and you don't go all the way to the spine, um, well, they're going to probably die from that, uh, at least in the Middle Ages they would. Modern, they'd probably, get, they'd probably survive. Um, but a thrust here is different from a thrust here. Uh, because here you're cutting major arteries that are going to honestly kill them very quickly. Likewise, if you strike two major arteries in the leg, it would matter a lot more going on to the inside of the leg versus the outside. Likewise, aiming for the heart means that if you hit up here in the upper chest region and not dead where the heart is, um, you aren't necessarily going to drop the individual and they will fight on. Gut stabs, even more so, right? People can survive days past uh, a stab to the gut. Um, now I'm talking about in the Middle Ages. There are people who survive battles and survive for multiple days, if not weeks, and then die because, you know, bacteria. All this to come to a conclusion to say that uh, how we fight needs to be under a little bit more scrutiny. Lest we go into the wrong direction with HEMA and we become more like sport fencing, all over again and completely miss the point of trying to revive this art in a lot of ways. So um, I highly encourage people who have a little bit of a strong count, uh, countenance, they, they can take a little bit of the violence, um, or even if you're just willing to skip pa past that part, I highly suggest you watch this at the very least, trying to gain a better understanding of, of what it means to actually train this as a martial art, as a, as a collective whole and not as a specific tool, right? We don't need to call ourselves long sword fighters. We need to call ourselves uh, martial artists. And you can't be a pure martial artist if all you've ever trained is a long sword. You cannot be uh, a, a martial artist if all you've ever done in an Asian martial art is learn how to throw punches and do forms, right? Um, if you've never learned how to do side kicks, roundhouse kicks, sweeps, you haven't learned how to use certain types of we uh, weapons or certain grappling moves, how can you call yourself a martial artist, right? So we need to kind of reinvent what this means. We need to rethink this this concept. Um, it's, it's a really interesting talk, and I think we're going to see a lot more of this begin to crop up over time. A lot more articles are going to be written on it. A lot more videos are going to be done on it. And that's a good thing. I think we need to constantly challenge our notion of what we're doing to make sure that we stay on track with the kind of end goal of this community of reviving this martial art and truly understanding what our forebears, at least for me, coming from a European background, what my forebears, what many people's forebears uh, in terms of English-speaking language uh, countries, um, <clears throat> where, where this all came from and, and what our history is. Uh, so I think it's really important. I, I think it's a really interesting concept. Again, go watch Mike's video if you haven't at this point, which you really should have. Um, I was uh, deeply honored that I got to be a part of actually getting that to the web. Uh, the, the video and audio is, is, is mine. Um, I, I got lucky there. I happened to be there at the same time, and I happened to be the person whose camera didn't give out on them. Um, and likewise, uh, you know, they, they did all the editing and all that, uh, put all the slides together. It's really great. Go check it out. Uh, good stuff all around. And um, that's it. That's that with that. Pretty much, I get to wrap up Long Point 2017. This is the last Long Point video, as it were. Um, really, I meant this just to kind of announce that Mike's video is out there, but I feel like I had a couple things I really wanted to add specifically. Um, and I'll probably do a lot more talks on this, or at least it'll be interspersed uh, as I come across this topic periodically in the future because I think it's a, a fascinating topic and something that I am personally challenging myself to try to do better with, to try to understand better. So uh, that's it, guys. Uh, Long Point 2017 finally completed in terms of video projects. Uh, again, um, Mike's video is great. Huge thanks to Mike Edelson for making a really great uh, talk and presenting that in a manner that I think uh, handles the topic fairly well um, and certainly does it with uh, some poignant examples. Uh, and then again, thanks to all the Long Point organizers for making all that possible in the first place. And thank you, my viewers, for getting to this point in this video and listening to me for this long. So cheers, guys. See you in the next video. And I hope in the future we're going to see more of this good stuff. Talk to you later.